that it seems like we are so divided on so many issues. And that it seems what happens is not just that we disagree or that we're divided, but we begin to hate one another and disrespect one another. That we begin to really struggle to love people that sit on the other side of the political aisle. Or people who think differently than me, who act differently than me, look differently than me, believe differently than me. And that my fear for our country and our world is that we are continuously living into this culture of hate and disagreement. And that deeply bothers me as a Christian, as someone who tries to follow Jesus, because as we have been talking about, that we who follow Jesus are the people characterized by love. That Jesus says we're to love God and love one another, love Democrats and love Republicans and love all sorts of different people. That love is to be the center of our lives. And so we've been talking about how do we actually do that, because it's really hard to live in love. So how do we actually do that? And so if you remember back to the first week of this series, I said the only way we can do this, the only way we can live in love is to realize that God empowers us to make it possible. That by our own selves and our own power, it seems impossible to live in love. It seems so hard to make that choice. But God's power that lives in us when we choose to believe in Jesus makes it possible for us to choose to live in love. It makes it possible to choose Jesus and to choose life. It makes us able to make better decisions. And not only are we able to make better decisions, but God's power has given us gifts. And so we talked about the different spiritual gifts that we have. We talked about apostleship and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. That these are gifts that God has given us to build up the church and to help us grow in our relationship with Christ. And today I want to actually end this sermon series by talking about what I think is one of the most profound yet difficult elements of love. And today we're going to talk about that one of the ways we live in love is through mutual submission. Mutual <coughs> submission. Now I'm going to be honest with you, I don't really like this word submission. It doesn't come easy to me. I've talked about this before. I wear this word surrender on my wrist. It's become kind of the word of my year this year of really wrestling through how do I surrender, live a life of surrender. And so when I first encountered submission as a spiritual practice, I like couldn't even read about it. I couldn't even think about it. I was like, God, you've got to be kidding me. Like this can't actually be a good spiritual practice. But I've grown in this more this year. I've wrestled with it more. And I'm going to be honest with you, really honest with you this morning, that I don't have this all figured out. This is still a practice that I am experimenting with, learning more about. So I'm going to share some thoughts that I have about mutual submission this morning. But I could be wrong. And in fact, that's one of the biggest dangers about standing up on a Sunday morning trying to teach about God's word is I probably get it wrong a lot of the time. And I apologize for that. I try my best to articulate what I think is the most faithful um, interpretation. But this morning, I could be wrong. And so if I say something this morning that you think is wrong, I invite you to challenge me on that and talk more about that. Because that only helps me understand this more and deeper. So it's my hope that this morning, we can wrestle with this difficult practice together. So to help us wrestle with it, we're going to talk about this out of Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, these are some difficult passages uh, that we're going to wrestle with this morning. So I invite you to pull out your Bible or the Bible from the front of the back of the pew and turn to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. So we're going to uh, begin reading there in just a few moments. So as you're turning to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, I want to talk to you about two of my favorite childhood games. So, the first one uh, up here on the board, does anyone know what this game is? Shoots and Ladders, right? Has uh, any, everyone played this game? You play, raise your hand if you played this game? Okay, so many of you know this game. I loved this game as a kid. In case you've never played Shoots and Ladders, how it works, you roll the dice, you start in the bottom left game spot, number one, and you try to work your way up the board to get to the top space where it says 100. Now, this game is the object of the game is to get to the top first. That's how you're the winner. So, for example, landing on space 28 is fantastic because you can take the ladder and get up to space 84. However, landing on 87 is the worst possible space because you would slide all the way back to 24. 
And so I love this game as a kid, trying to uh, get ahead and get up the ladders to make it to the top. I love this game so much that we had another version of the game that was called Snakes and Ladders. Have any of you seen this, where it was snakes instead of slides? So I mean, love this game as a kid. One of my favorites. Okay, Shoes and Ladders. Another of my favorites is the game of life. Can you want to play this for us? Okay, good. So we got your little plastic cars, we got your little plastic spouse, we got your little plastic kids, and you like spin the spinner and go around the board, and then you figure out what your job's going to be, if you're going to go to college or not, what your job's going to be, what your house is going to be, um, you know, how much money you're going to collect, are you going to buy insurance or not, you know, and so you're going around the board making little decisions about the game of life. But who wins in the game of life? You guys know this, who wins? Who wins at the game of life? Who wins? Okay. Anyone know who wins at the game of life? He who has the most toys. He who has the most toys or the most money wins at the game of life, right? In the game of life, it doesn't matter if you finish first. It doesn't matter if you have the most fun playing the game. It doesn't matter if you have the best family or the best job. What matters in the game of life is that you have the most money. That's how you win at the game of life. And so I love playing these games as a kid. Honest confession, I still enjoy these games. But what I realized is that these games teach us a lot about the narrative that we live in in America, right? Like we live in this world where we have so many ladders that we're trying to climb, that we're just trying to get ahead in life as fast as we can. Sometimes we even call them like corporate ladders, right? Like we're trying to to climb the corporate ladder to get ahead as fast as we can, have the best job, the best money, the best position, the most power. Sometimes we don't even realize it, but we start climbing these ladders sometimes unconsciously, right? Like we might start out in this nice little starter home, but then we get a bigger home, or we start up with a bigger car, we get a better car, we get a bigger and better family, a better job, we find that we have more power and status and privilege, and before we even know it, we just start climbing up the ladder. And some people climb really fast, and it's almost this competition, this like dog-eat-dog -dog world, like I need to push you out of the way so I can climb the ladder faster. And this is what our culture is like, that we seem to be climbing all these ladders. And some of us, we might look at that and be like, well, you know what, I don't actually feel that powerful. Like, I haven't climbed that many ladders in my life. I'm not really that powerful. But if you zoomed out and looked at the global picture, you'd realize that all of us who live in this country are more powerful than we can imagine. Just by being born in this country, we have such access to such power that other people don't in the world. That we have access to such economic resources, to educational resources, to political power, that if you zoomed out in the world, many of us, whether we realize it or not, are pretty far up on the ladder of life. And so this is the narrative that we seem to tell ourselves of trying to get ahead and, and climb the ladder and get, gain more and more power. And so I want to talk about this idea of power this morning. And I want you to hear me very clearly that it's not power itself that's the problem. But it's how we use the power that we have that's important. And so to talk about this, I think we have to look at the model of Jesus. Because when you look at Jesus, talk about power, Jesus was the most powerful person who ever lived, right? Like Jesus is the son of God. You can't get much more powerful than that. He's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Like you can't climb any more ladders beyond that. He's so powerful. But notice how Jesus uses his power. That Jesus is willing to slide down, to become born as a baby, not in a hospital or a five-star resort, but in a barn in Bethlehem, in like the middle of nowhere, largely unnoticed except by a couple of smelly shepherds. And he's placed in this feeding trough, and then he grows up a little bit, but the king wants to kill him. So Jesus and his parents have to go live as refugees in Egypt for several years until he finally can come back home and he lives his pretty normal life until about age 30 when he starts wandering around Israel telling people about God, who he calls his father, which is really strange. And he's telling people not just about God, but about God's kingdom. That is this like other way of life, a different way of living that's so different from the narrative of this world. And so Jesus says, he begins to talk about kind of flipping the games of this world on their heads. I think if Jesus played shoots and ladders, he'd flip the board on its head and say, no, life is
is not about trying to get ahead and gain power, but it's about being willing to empower others. And so Jesus shows us this life of submission. <coughs> he's on this mission, but he's willing to submit to others. He's willing to stop and talk to a woman at the well. Nobody talked to women back then. They were considered property. They didn't have any value. But Jesus would stop and talk with her. Healed a woman who was bleeding for 12 years. He invited the children to come to be with him, that he would bless them. Jesus was willing to submit to take the position of a slave to wash his disciples' feet, even Judas, who would betray him. Jesus was willing even to submit to the political and religious powers who wanted to kill him. And so Jesus lived this life of submission that took him to the cross as the ultimate act of submission. And when people saw Jesus on the cross, they just couldn't get it, right? Because they were looking at it like we often do in the lens of this world. They're like, Jesus, if you're so powerful, what are you doing? If you're so powerful, why don't you save yourself and get yourself off the cross? What are you doing? And they couldn't see in the lens of this world that Jesus, by living this life of submission, was about ready to make the biggest difference the world had ever seen, to give all of us access to abundant life. That when Jesus died and then later was rose from the dead, it meant that we could have true, good, and abundant life now and forever. That somehow in submitting, in submitting his life to all that the world had to offer him, he was able to rise again that all of us could have eternal life. And what I think is so profound about Jesus' life is that he shows us that mutual submission. Vlad, can you go ahead and advance it? It's not. Here we go. That mutual submission is not about seeking to be in power. Jesus doesn't spend his life trying to climb the ladders and be at the top of the hierarchy or the political or social system. Mutual submission is not seeking to be in power, but it's seeking to empower, empower others so that they have better lives. That that's what we see in the person of Jesus, that he doesn't seek to be in power, but he seeks to empower us so that all of us can have access to this true and abundant life. That's the model. Jesus is the model of biblical submission. And so what happens is that Paul and others pick up on this model, that they see Jesus as the model of how to live a Christian life in mutual submission. And so that's what Paul is referring to as he begins to write in Ephesians 5. So let's turn there together and begin reading Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence, Christ. That first verse is very important. If you're following along, you might want to underline it. It is the foundation of the other verses that follow. So be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Christ is the model. That's who we're seeking to follow in his life of submission. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the, of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her and with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, yes, so that she may be holy without blemish. <coughs> In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Because we are members of his body, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. These are challenging words that we've just read. And perhaps maybe for some of us, we're like, what in the world was that? Like, how was that even in the Bible? Like, isn't that sexist? Like, what is that? You know, some of us have that response, and that's okay, because I think we need to wrestle with these words looking at the model of Jesus, looking at them through the lens of Jesus' life and the culture in which Paul was writing. 
So Paul is writing these world, words in a Greco-Roman world where the man was the head of the household who had the most power in society. Men were at the top of those social ladders. They held the three most powerful positions of being father, husband, and master, and they had all in complete control. Women and children and slaves had no control, no say whatsoever. They were just seen as property, and they were powerless at the bottom of the ladder. And there were these things uh, that were called household codes in the time that Paul is writing that would explain different people's uh, relationships and actions and responsibilities within a household. So Paul is taking this idea that was very common in society of a household code, but he's applying it to a Christian household and a family. And Paul is saying that this is how you should live your life in light of Jesus' model. And so Paul begins with the people who are at the bottom of the ladder. And he says, why submit to your husbands? Now, this would have been, have been shocking to the women in Paul's culture because that's just what they did. It was part, part of culture. They blindly submitted to their husbands. They had no power to do it elsewhere. But what we often miss is that in these words, Paul is actually liberating the women to choose to submit to their husbands. That he's making the moral agents that you actually have a choice to submit, not because society tells you to, but because Jesus, who you follow, lived a life of submission. You see, we kind of miss this in Ephesians, but in other letters that Paul is writing, Paul is talking about the liberating power of the good news of Jesus Christ, how it is setting people free. In fact, when he writes to the church in Galatia, Paul says it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. You have been set free from your own sin that has bond, bound you from the oppression of society that you live in. You are set free. In fact, you have been set free that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so what this means is that in Christ, we are all equal. There is no hierarchy in the family of God, in the body of Christ. We're all equal. Men and women were equal. And that was setting women free in incredible ways. And so Paul is saying, now you have a choice to submit to your husband, not because society tells you to, but because that's what you see in Jesus, that you're to mutually submit to one another in love. Now notice, Paul spends about three verses talking to the wives, but then he spends nine verses talking to the husbands, of saying, hey guys, you who are at the top of the ladder, you who have all the power, you are also supposed to mutually submit to your wife in love. You are supposed to love your wife just as Jesus loved the church. And how much did Jesus love the church? Jesus loved the church this much. That Jesus was willing to die for the church, for us. That's how much Jesus loved the church. And so Paul's saying, husbands, you're to love your wives this much that you would be willing to die for her. That you have this kind of self-sacrificing love. That you would mutually submit to one another in love. That both of you, as husband and wife, you wouldn't see your role as trying to seek to be in power and to oppress one another, but that you would see the power that you have through Christ Jesus as a way to submit to one another and empower one another so that your lives become better. And so I, I ask, well, what does this look like in our, in our marriages as we seek to follow Jesus? Well, I think this biblical model of submission plays out in big and small ways, right? Uh, I was thinking of a story from Chris and I's honeymoon of when we were in Greece. We were taking this tour around the city of Athens. And so we did this like free walking tour. It was great. It was a little warm because uh, it was July in uh, Greece, so it was hot. And we finished our tour up near the Acropolis, which is a high part of the city near the Parthenon. And so we decided we were going to get lunch, and then we were going to go tour the Parthenon. Well, the tour guide uh, had given us some suggestions of where to eat, of good local places to eat. And she like marked them on my map. And I'm a little bit of a foodie, so I was like, Chris, like let's go to this place that she recommends. I really want to try to find it and eat there. And uh, Chris was very gracious, and he was willing to like honor my request to go try to find a new place to eat. Now, side note, there was a restaurant literally right by where the tour ended, but Chris was gracious enough to be like, okay, we'll go try to find the place that you want to eat at. So we go on this little adventure, use our map, try to find it. 
well, we took a couple wrong turns, we got lost several times, and by this point, Chris is getting more and more hungry and like frustrated and needs a place to eat, And uh, but I'm still trying to find where I want to go to eat, but eventually I realized like, okay, this is getting a little out of hand, so like, I'm willing to like let go of my desire to eat here and let's just find a place, like the closest place to eat. But then Chris like is willing to give one more last effort to try to find where we're going, and so he's willing to put that aside, his own hunger, to find the place. And eventually we did actually find the place to eat. And there's a whole other long story of how that all ended up on another time. I'll have to share that story at another time. But what you can see in that small, simple story is that we are willing, in small ways, to mutually submit to one another. I had this desire, this request, to find this specific restaurant. And Chris was willing to go with that, even though he could kind of care less where we ate lunch that day. And then when I wasn't working out, then I was willing to let go of that desire so we could just meet his basic need of providing lunch for him. But he was willing to let that go to try to find it one more time. So there was this mutual submission of back and forth of putting each other's desires and needs ahead of the others. That we weren't seeking to be empowered to impress each other, but we were trying to empower each other to make our lives better. It plays out in small ways, right, about what we decide to eat or what we decide to do or go on a date night or not, what that looks like. But it also plays out in big life decisions, right? Like when Chris and I were getting married, we had to decide where we're going to live. And so I was living in Washington, D.C., and I kind of wanted to stay in that area. And he was living in State Line, and he wanted to stay in that area. But we had to address those concerns and our interests and desires to one another and we were able though to just lay those on the table and to submit them to one another and i think what happened in that mutual submission of naming our own desires that we were able to submit them to one another and to god that i think in that mutual submission god's will was able to emerge that led us to where we are today and so I think in big and small ways, as we mutually submit to one another in our closest relationships, we're able to value one another, to empower one another, and to even see God's will in each other's lives. Paul talks not just to wives and husbands, but to children and parents. This is Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Paul says, children, you are to obey your parents. You're to obey that fifth commandment. In fact, growing up, whenever I disobeyed my parents, my parents would always be like, number five, number five is a reminder of obeying the fifth commandment. But you don't always do that just as a kid, right? I just don't do that living in my parents' home, but I do that even now as an adult. That no matter how old we are, we are to always honor and respect our parents. I actually see many of you doing this as you care for your parents who are aging, and that when you show them love and respect and you provide and seek the best care for them and you take time to go and visit them, you are living into a biblical model of submission, of honoring your parents no matter how old they are. Parents, even though you are the dominant partner in this relationship, you have the power, especially when you have young children, to help raise them up. You're not supposed to oppress them with that power, but you're to use that power to empower them. So I see this happening when maybe you've had a long week and you're tired and you don't want to get up and come to church on a Sunday morning, but you do, and you bring the kids or the grandkids with you because you know how important their spiritual formation is, and you're putting their spiritual needs maybe even ahead of your own. I see this happen when you serve as Sunday school teachers and you help equip them and empower the next generation. You are living into this biblical model of submission. So it's not just about wives and husbands. It's not even just about children and parents. But Paul goes on in the next section and talks about slaves and masters. Now I'm just going to say right up, this is a really hard passage uh, to talk about because of the incredible abuses of slavery and the horrific ways it's been used across the world and in this country alone that I think continue to haunt us. But for Paul, this was a really, um, just a reality of his world, where slavery was an approved economic institution. In fact, there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. So this was a reality for Paul. And I want to read these words this morning and see if we can, if we're even able to apply them to our lives today. This is verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 5. 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm, as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them. For you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. Like I said, that's a tough passage, and it's with a heavy heart that I even acknowledge that those words were used by pastors in this country to justify the practices of slavery. And so they have been abused and misused in so many ways, and thankfully we don't have approved institutional slavery anymore in our society. But we still have this economic institution that many of us are a part of. In fact, when I was reading in my study Bible about this passage, a scholar brought up that many of the positions that slaves held in the Roman Empire, we would consider to be employable positions for us today. And so what that means is in the Roman Empire, doctors, teachers, secretaries, they were all positions that were held by slaves. And today, in our world, those are some pretty well-respected positions. And so what the scholar suggested is that we don't talk about slaves and masters anymore, but we could talk about employees and employers. That we could apply this passage and say, employees, obey your employers. Work with enthusiasm. Give your best work. Mutually submit to them in love. That means that we are honest and we work at our work as the best that we can. We submit to the decisions that our employers make, whether we always agree with them or not. And employers, you are to be life-giving, empowering to your employees. But you're to provide for them, to make sure they're able to care for their wives and their children, to have space to help with their families, to help create good working environments for them, to help them be able to live empowered lives. And so I think what we see in Paul this morning is that Jesus is the model. That Jesus shows us that it's not about seeking to be in power, but it's seeking to empower others to live better lives in all of our relationships that we encounter. Now, I do want to say that this is not easy. Like I said at the beginning, I struggle with this. I think many of us struggle with this because we're almost hard, hardwired to want to do what we want when we want it. And it's really hard to think about submitting to one another in love. It's also really hard because I think we have this tendency as humans to live at extremes. So I think why these words, unfortunately, have sometimes been used to abuse women and abuse children and have justified slavery, I think that's happened because our own sinful nature sometimes reads these words and we use it to justify our own power. So when we're at the top of the ladder and we read some of these words, we think, that's right, you should submit to me. I am in power. So I'm going to use these words to justify my own oppression of others and st stay at the top of the ladder and try to oppress everyone else. But whenever submission crosses over the line and becomes about death and oppression and destruction, that is not a biblical model of submission. A biblical model of submission is about life and love, a different way of living, about following the life of Jesus. It's not about destroying and oppressing others. That is not a biblical model of submission. The other extreme is also true. Sometimes we read these words and maybe we're at the bottom of the ladder. We feel like we're powerless or like we don't have any self-worth. And so we just become a doormat and we just let people pass over us all the time and we don't have a voice and we don't have an opinion and we think that we're completely worthless and powerless. That's also not a biblical model of submission. Because we talked about this, each and every single one of us is powerful, not from ourselves, but because of God's power living in us. It's not power that's the problem. All of you are more powerful than you can imagine because of God's power in you, right? Jesus was the most powerful person who ever lived. Jesus didn't live his life as a doormat. He knew his purpose. He was on a mission to save the world, but he was willing to submit to others along the way to show grace to them, to help empower them to live better lives. And that's what we should be about as well. That we're not seeking to be at the top of the ladder to oppress others, but we're seeking to empower others so that they will have a better life. And I think when we do that, our lives will get better too. 
Help us will realize the secret that true life is found when we're willing to give our lives away and empower others to make life better for other people. So I just want to close this way this morning with two thoughts of how we can actually live this week in mutual submission. As I was thinking about this practice, I think mutual submission actually liberates us. It's kind of crazy to think about it, but it liberates us in two ways. The first is that it liberates us from the burden of having to always get what we want. We seem wired this way, right? You deny a two-year-old a candy bar in the grocery store, and all of a sudden there's a huge meltdown, like with this shirt, right? We seem to be wired to get what we want, and we carry around this burden since the time we're like two till sometimes our whole lives, right? So we might not get what we want when we're 52, but we might not throw a uh, temper temper tantrum and have a meltdown, but we might hold a grudge or we might get really angry, or we might pout for a couple hours, days, years, when we don't always get what we want, right? And so when we live into this biblical practice of submission, it liberates us from that burden that we carry around to always have to get what we want, to get our own way. And when we say, you know what? I don't have to get what I want. Life doesn't have to go my own way. I can surrender that. I can give up that burden of always having to get what I want. And when we do that, it liberates us. It liberates us from always that selfish need to always get our own way and to have what we want. It liberates us from that burden and liberates us to valuing other people. That perhaps for the first time in our lives, when we give up always having to get what we want, we can begin to look at other people and see how valued and loved that they are. Valuing other people simply for who they are, not, what, not for what they can do for us. Loving them with no strings attached. Loving them, not even expecting them to love us in return. But to love them unconditionally, the same kind of love that God has for us. That when we do that, we can really become people who live in love. Church, it's my hope that you know that you are more powerful than you can imagine. Because of God's power in you. That you are gifted. That you are able to choose life. And that you are able to live in love. This week I hope you are liberated and are able to give up your desire to always have your own way. To be able to value others and to live in love. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for these challenging hard words that we've wrestled with this morning. God, we thank you for the model of your son Jesus who showed us how to live how to love. God, we're asking for that same kind of love in our lives. God, for that same kind of power. God, I pray that you would help us to mutually submit to one another in love this week. God, that's so hard, and God, we screw it up so easily. God, I just pray that you would give us grace when we stumble and fall, that you would liberate us to begin to try to give up having to have our own way, that we don't always have to get what we want. God, that you would set us free to value other people, to see them as beloved children created in your image with their own thoughts and desires and dreams. And God, set us on fire with a passion to help empower others, to help make other people's lives better. God, because I believe that's such a good desire of you. That's the indwelling of your kingdom among us. So God, I pray that you would fill us up and send us out this week to live in love. In Jesus' name we pray.